Philippines from the Hawkwind Cancer Society Research Center up in Grafton. So Kevin, in uh, addition to uh, working on cancer, is also a practicing veterinary surgeon who completely is uh, his being favorite of the business and, and has been working on uh, modeling um, uh, hypoxic inner environments in cancer tumors uh, using data making centers. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to give the seminar. Um, I'm going to give a fairly historical account of what I've been doing over the last 10 or 15 years. I, I hope it's um, not too much repetition for people who have heard it before, but it's basically, I'll be basically talking about how we used computational modelling at the tissue level to select an improved analogue of a hypoxia selective anti-cancer drug. Um, and this started during my PhD with, with Bill Wilson and then continued as a research fellow after that. Just briefly about the um, Cancer Research Centre. Uh, we're focused on developing anti-cancer drugs. The director is Prof Bill Denny um, and co-directors Bruce Bagley, uh, Bill Wilson and Mark McKeag. We have a fairly large centre on New Zealand standards, about 80 staff and students. We cover a range of um, drug development. Uh, we've had several drugs go into our, or are in clinical trial and there's a particularly large interest in our centre on targeting tumours at above the cellular level, that's at the tissue or physiological level because um, the, the tumour physiology is very important in tumour development and pathogenesis. Um, and Bill Wilson's group in particular um, had in the 1990s two grants from the NCI in America to develop um, drugs which could radiosensitize tumors, <coughs> um, or at least the hypoxic cell in tumors. And during that time, though, there was a paradigm shift between wanting to radiosensitize the hypoxic cells and tumours to actually overcoming hypoxia by, by killing the hypoxic cells with drugs. Um, the, um, however, um, these drugs tend to be limited by their transport from the blood vessel to the hypoxic cells which are most distant from the tumour capillaries. Um, the research that, that uh, Bill had done led to a collaboration with um, Prof. Martin Brown and Stanford, uh, two NCI grants to develop hypoxia-targeted drugs. And because of the extravascular transport problem, um, we realised that a new approach was needed to try and develop these drugs. So just briefly, why is tumour physiology important? Well, uh, as tumours grow, they, um, they outgrow the ability of oxygen and nutrients to diffuse in, into them um, and allow cells to continue growing. The response of both the tumour cells and the, and the inflammatory response around the tumours is to produce angiogenic factors uh, which lead to an incoordinated um, angiogenesis, uh, which uh, then leads to uh, very atypical um, vasculature compared to normal organs. This vasculature is, it tends to be tortuous, very leaky. Um, most of the vessels that are, are recruited become, uh, become uh, exchange vessels, so you can have extremely large, what you would call physiologically called capillaries because they're exchange vessels, um, as well as neoangiogenesis producing very atypical, um, atypical capillaries. And also there are much larger interstitial distances between capillaries in certain areas in the tumours compared to normal tissues. So sometimes um, uh, drugs and um, nutrients have to diffuse 10 or 20 cell diameters in order to get to the target cells. This is an example of one of the consequences, I don't know whether you can see that too well, but um, one of the consequences of uh, this disorganized um, vascular supply where um, you've got uh, blue is, um, is, is patent blood vessels where, where blood is flowing. Um, the red area is hypoxic uh, 
tissue where oxygen can't diffuse can't, can't diffuse all the way between capillaries, so you get uh, regions of hypoxia between capillaries. And in green, you can see new, new, e either new blood vessels forming or vessels which have temporary, cl temporary closed and are not actually perfusing the tissue, uh, surrounded by hypoxic tissue. So, just a cartoon about this hypoxia, just to emphasize that the vessels become tortuous, there's no longer a regular pattern to, to the blood vessels in the, in the tumors. Hypoxia develops between, you can have, um, so, so you end up with, with diffusion limited hypoxia where you've got a patent blood vessel, but oxygen has been consumed so rapidly that it can't diffuse to all of the cells um, at the periphery. These cells are going to die eventually and form necrotic areas and you can have temporary occlusion of blood vessels where the whole tumour cord basically becomes um, hypoxic. And so there's been a large body of research over 40 or 50 years to try and overcome this hypoxia problem in tumours. Um, and it's been demonstrated over and over again that it limits um, it, it limits therapy in human tumours, um, that hypoxic cells are radio resistant um, and that uh, and that hypoxic tumours are more are more aggressive and have a more malignant phenotype than non hypoxic tumours. I'll skip that one. One of one of the major reasons why hypoxia is such a problem is that oxygen is required to fix the, the initial DNA damage caused by radiation. It oxidizes the, the lesions that the ionizing radiation causes. So what you can see here is a survival curve as a function of radiation dose. Uh, this is surviving fraction or the amount of cells that, or the proportion of cells that are left surviving. Under well oxygenated conditions, um, there is substantial killing by uh, by radiation. Under, under anoxic conditions, radiation, uh, the cells are much more resistant to radiation by a factor called the oxygen enhancement ratio, which is generally of the order of about three. And although this may not look a particularly big distance, when you compare the amount of killing that you get under hypoxia here with the amount of killing for the same dose of radiation under oxid, ox, oxic conditions here, it causes an enormous resistance in, um, in cancer. So the basic principle of these hypoxia-activated prodrugs, as they're called, is the prodrug um, is oxidized by what's called one electron reductases in um, tumor cells to a, to a radical species. Now, under well oxygenated conditions, this radical species can be oxidized back to the prodrug and therefore is, um, is, not, is not toxic to, to well oxygenated cells. In the absence of oxygen, this prodrug radical goes on to either cause DNA damage itself or be further reduced to drugs which can then diffuse, around, diffuse out of the cells and cause um, DNA damage to surrounding cells and that's called a bystander effect. And um, th these are a number of, um, of drugs that have been developed. Terapazamine, which I'll talk a lot about, and the analog that we developed, SN30,000. PR104, which is one of these types of drugs, which has a bystander effect, was developed in our lab. TH302 is a similar compound, which has been developed by Threshold Pharmaceuticals and is, is in phase three clinical trial. Um, and a number of other drugs which have been developed in our lab, including ones that um, target molecular targets rather than targeting DNA. The basic principle is that if you give these drugs around about the time of radiation, you can complement the activity of radiation. So radiation is going to kill a lot of cells in the, in the high and intermediate oxygen concentration, and the hypoxia-selective prodrug is going to kill a lot of the cells at low concentration, low oxygen concentrations. <coughs> 
terapezamine was the most um, advanced hypoxia reactivated prodrug. In, um, it, it went into uh, numerous phase three clinical trials. It has basically the sim a similar action to, uh, to what I showed before, so I won't go through this complicated stuff. Um, and it, it, it has no bystander effect, so it can't diffuse out and kill the surrounding cells, so, but um, it is activated at it's activated at relatively high oxygen concentrations so that it can complement radiation fairly well. Um, and as I said, it, it almost made it through phase three clinical trials, and there are a number of reasons why it didn't. Um, one of them was it was just too toxic when combined with cisplatin compared to, um, compared to the, the standard of treatment at the time. Another reason was that despite decades of, of clinical trials on radiosensitizers, there was no staging of, client, of, the, um, of the patients into whether they had tumours which had a high level of hypoxia or not. Um, so here you can see a tumour imaged by PET with, with hypoxia. If they, when they, uh, in the clinical trials, uh, they, did a, they did some small stu studies where they imaged for hypoxia before they gave the, the medication. And when they pulled those particular patients out and had a look at the, their survival, it showed that in the terapezamine arm, there was substantially better um, failure-free survival for terapezamine and cisplatin versus for the standard of care, which was 5-fluorouracil and cisplatin at the same time. But unfortunately, these numbers were small and they weren't really enough to, to save terapezamine and allow it to go into a more rationally designed clinical trial where you would actually select patients for hypoxia. Uh, during... During uh, all of this, while, the, while all the trials were going on, we did, we did identify some other problems with terapezamine. One was its marginal solubility, um, but it, it, um, evidence came to light that the hypoxia selective cytotoxicity of terapezamine was much lower in tumours than it was in single cell culture, and there was evidence that um, it was because extravascular transport limited the diffusion of terapezamine to the hypoxic cells which are most distant from capillaries. And the reason for that um, is that terapezamine is, it has to be metabolized in order to uh, do its job. So, um, so, ter so um, metabolism to the active drug is a necessary part of these drugs. You, you can't avoid it. Um, so we came up with the hypothesis that, um, that basically that if we could improve the extravascular tra transport of terapezamine analogues, then we would be able to improve its therapeutic ratio and provide more killing in the hypoxic regions. So typical, so, so what we did was we added some 3D uh, investigations in, in uh, 3D in vitro cultures and three-dimensional three PKPD modelling to the normal sort of sequence that you go through when you're developing a drug, uh, which starts usually with target val validation and isolated enzyme and receptor studies um, right up to um, scale up preclinical toxicology. And if it makes it through all of that, then it can go into clinical trials and a few drugs manage to get right out the other end and, and become registered. But there's a very large attrition rate as you go through this sequence. So we felt that perhaps we could weed out some of the duds by adding some extra um, steps to the process. And we did this by investigating the diffusion of terapezamine and in multicellular layers, which is, which are um, basically layers of cancer cells are grown on a porous support membrane in these um, in, in these little wells, uh, which are used for growing monolayer cultures quite often. Um, the the um, multilayer is then put between a donor compartment and a receiver compartment in a diffus diffusion chamber, 
and the drug is introduced into the donor compartment and its disappearance from the donor compartment and its appearance in the receiver compartment is measured over time and it can be measured very accurately by high performance liquid chromatography or mass spectrometry so you can tell the difference between parent drug diffusing through or its metabolites and this was quite an advance on what was available um, at the time. In fact this the mathematical and, um, uh, and uh, experimental techniques uh, were first, that I'm going to describe now, were first described um, in a collaboration between us and um, Prof Peter Hunter and, and one of his students and Bill Wilson and, and myself um, back in 1997. This is the apparatus, fairly simple, just um, that you, you can gas these diffusion chambers with, a, with whatever gassing you want to maintain pH and oxygen conditions. Uh, you can uh, put drug into down these sampling ports and, and remove drug from each port as a function of time. And if we do that for terapazamine, under well oxygenated conditions, this is the diffusion curve that you get. Co concentration in the receiver compartment is a function of time. And if we then do it under anoxic conditions, you can see the, uh, the decrease in penetration that you get when uh, drug is metabolized. So drug is being metabolized quite rapidly as it diffuses 150 to 200 200 micrometers across a multicellular layer and we then extracted the diffusion coefficient and rate, rate of metabolism from this type of data using mathematical models developed in that previous paper I showed. But you do run into the problem once you've got the diffusion coefficient and the rate of metabolism, what does it all mean biologically? So what we tended to do was then uh, another thing that we started off in the 1997 paper was we also ran simultaneous experiments in single cell, single cell stirred single cell cultures where we could actually measure the rate of drug metabolism by HPLC and we could measure the amount of cell killing by clonogenic assay. By plating these cells and counting the number of colonies that grow you can determine how, much, uh, how, how many cells have been killed by the drug. And I won't go over in this in too much detail, but basically you get, uh, you get metabolism information and cell killing information out of these experiments. You get diffusion information out of these experiments. And by putting it all together into uh, a one-dimensional diffusion model, we were able to predict the, the expected concentration field inside the multicellular layer. And then using this survival data, we were able to show that survival is going to be greatly inhibited in the centre of the multi-layer compared, um, com compared to the outside when this whole multi-layer was an anoxic. And um, we then basically ran this model here for each one of these each one of these multi-layers and compared it to the amount of killing as a function of terapazamine concentration that you get in single cells and showed that there's a large difference between the killing in multi-layers because of this uh, lack of killing in the centre compared to single cells and in fact our model could, could, um, could, could very well uh, fit this data uh, which really basically meant that no other there's no other processes going on. This, that, this lack of sensitivity in the, in the multi-layer is purely a function of the poor, extra, the, the poor transport in the multi-layer. Okay, so then we ask the question, can we, can we go further and predict the um, tumour activity in, um, in, in tumour xenografts, which have a proper... Um, vascular network, not just a sim simple laboratory system, and for that we need the oxygen dependence of terapazamine, the plasma pharmacokinetics and plasma protein binding. Fortuitously, at, at about the that time, um, 
Tim, Tim Seekham in Arizona had published a oxygen transport model for a small mapped mic microvascular network which had been mapped out of a rat window chamber model which is approximately 200 by 500 by 500 micrometer cube of tumor tissue and it, ha it has blood flows, it has um, a uh, capillary network all mapped, and this is the uh, this is the pattern of oxygen that um, is is produced using a using a Green's function method, where basically where the um, the mapped uh, vessels are are um, uh, basically um, simulated as sources of oxygen. The tissue is is discretized and is simulated as sinks of oxygen and then the, um, the, the, uh, the model is allowed to f uh, find the basically the distribution of oxygen throughout this cube. So this is, this is one um, section through this cube with the whole blood vessel superimposed on top of it and showing blue, er blue areas are hypoxic areas, red areas are well oxygenated areas and you can see a lot of the features of what's going on in tumours here where oxygen is being is being metabolised so rapidly that it's actually being extracted from these smaller vessels so you get hypoxia near vessels as well as uh, distant from vessels um, so, so this is a much more realistic system than the simple 1D models um, and just to summarise that it has many of the features of real tumours. It has a large range of distribution to the nearest vessel, has a large range of capillary diameters, large range of heterogeneous blood flow rates, and a typical oxygen concentration, which has been me measured numerous times in both animal tumours and human tumours. We, we then basically repeated those experiments, those single cell experiments that I showed previously, but at a range of oxygen, measured oxygen concentrations using an oxylight uh, oxygen probe to measure the oxygen concentrations and then measured the rate of metabolism of terapazamine as a function of oxygen concentration. You can see that that oxygen suppresses terapazamine metabolism quite rapidly uh, with, with a, a, a half value of about one micromolar. So at about 1.5 millimetres of mercury, um, the rate of metabolism and therefore the cytotoxicity of terapazamine is, is half suppressed. And we also measured plasma pharmacokinetics in, in mice. And if we put that into the, into the Green's function model on top of the oxygen distribution, which uh, has already been, um, which has already been simulated. This is this is a simulation of the effect of terapazamine metabolism on its distribution near the capillary. So, you've got areas where there's quite low terapazamine concentrations, areas where there's quite high terapazamine concentrations. These tend to be the hypoxic regions. These tend to be the uh, the oxic regions, these tend to be the hypoxic regions where terapazamine is most needed. And we could then use these parameters to model the distribution of terapazamine concentration as a function of oxygen concentration in this microvascular network and then relate that to the amount of cell killing in this microvascular network. So this is the predicted amount of cell killing in in the tissue spaces of the microvascular network from terapazamine. This is the predicted amount of killing that you would get if there was no transport impediment. So clearly we felt that there was uh, a marked transport problem for terapazamine. And this transport problem is caused by a low diffusion coefficient and a relatively high rate of metabolism. If we want to develop analogues of this, however, it's not just a matter of trying to maximise the 
uh, maximize the rate of metabolism or minimize the rate of metabolism because if you minimize the rate of metabolism you fall off this side because the compound is no longer potent. If you maximize the rate of metabolism and make it a very potent compound you're going to fall off this side uh, because the drug can't penetrate at all and in fact if you make the rate of metabolism of the analogs too too high, it'll actually kill the well-oxygenated cells but won't kill any of the poorly oxygenated cells. So we realised we would have to try and increase the diffusivity of these compounds by uh, various substitutions um, but optimise the metabolism for them. So basically we, as I said, we introduced some extra steps in this process of screening the, um, the compounds and in particular we introduced this step here where we, it, where we measured all the in vitro parameters, put it into the model and then asked whether it could still be hypoxia selective or whether metabolism is too fast and, it, and the drug is just not going to penetrate. If it could still be hypoxia selective in the model we then went on and did pharmacokinetics once we'd done the pharmacokinetics, we used the pharmacokinetics to rerun the model and ask whether, it's, whether this compound is going to be better than terapazamine. If it was, or, or if it was going to be active, basically. If it was, it was allowed through to further animal testing. If it wasn't, then we sidelined it. But we go, from both of these points here, we, we gained valuable feedback to feed back to the chemists for synthesis of new compounds. And to compare our predictions to what's happening in a tumour xenograft, basically what we do is we give the drug to tumour-bearing mice, we remove the tumours, homogenise them and plate them, and then, then plate the surviving fraction here um, versus, versus the treatment. Uh, so that we're comparing a survival endpoint in real tumours with a survival endpoint predicted by, um, by the model. And here, for example, is terapazamine plus radiation. Uh, terapazamine um, alone is not there, but uh, terapazamine alone causes no killing. Radiation causes this much. Terapazamine improves the situation a bit, and one of the analogues improves the situation a lot more. So over the whole analogue program, <coughs> we've done a final analysis of it. Um, there were 18 active compounds, and this is the predicted number of um, logs of cell kill over and above radiation alone, and this is the measured number of uh, uh, measured number of logs of cell kill over radiation alone and if we included extravascular transport in the model we could we had a very good correlation between um, between predicted and measured cell killing in this microvascular network if we assumed that the drug equilibrates throughout the uh, extravascular compartment then um, we had a very poor poor prediction. So this really was confirmation that uh, extravascular transport is very important for this class of drugs. That's just a summary of oops, summary of um, so basically we, we had 18 pass this so 18 were predicted to be active, 16 out of the 18 were actually active. We allowed 12 inactive compounds to go through as well, and 12 out of 12 of the compounds that were predicted to be inactive were actually inactive. That just shows the range of diffusion coefficients and rates of metabolism which were investigated over the whole study. And one of the, one of the um, interesting parts of the study is, was the ability to develop some predictive models for the diffusion coefficient as a function of physicochemical parameters. And 
some of the one of the surprising things was that the bulk diffusion coefficient of these uh, of these compounds could actually vary over almost two orders of magnitude depending on the cell line that you choose so uh, some of these cell lines are very densely packed some of these cell, uh, cell lines are uh, not very densely packed at all so cell line and physicochemical parameters um, are responsible for the diffusion coefficient of these compounds. This just shows some of the some of the analogs that were developed. Um, the, the, uh, so this is a um, reasonably potent analog, but um, had a uh, uh, but <coughs> fa uh, failed because oh, its pharmacokinetics wasn't particularly good. Uh, this is a particularly low potency compound um, which has good penetration uh, which is measured by its penetration half distance here has good penetration but was not potent enough and finally this compound SN30,000 which has better pen penetration than terapazamine and a better diffusion coefficient and, and is much more potent so SN30,000 when you do the modelling and compare it to terapazamine, you expect to see um, in, around about two logs of cell kill when you average it over the whole tumour region, compared to about uh, about half a log of cell kill when you average it over the whole tumour region. And uh, that's summarised here for terapazamine and SM30,000. And in fact, when we looked at it in a number of xenograph models, that's exactly what we saw. Um, SN30,000 and another analogue were consistently better than um, terapazamine in both uh, single dose and fractionated radiation experiments. So just summarising, um, we, we managed to select an analogue using this computational modelling approach which has uh, improved penetration compared to terapazamine. It turned out that it had an improved hypoxic cytotoxic ratio, which has improved oxygen selectivity than, than terapazamine. It's <coughs> got good predicted activity in, um, in xenografts, and it had improved solubility. And it's now undergone a lot of um, preclinical testing, and we're um, looking to try and get it into phase one clinical trials. Um, another bonus of doing all of this modelling is that we can, we've also used, just recently, used the plasma pharmacokinetics from, of terapazamine from the human clinical trials and asked the question if SN30,000 could achieve that same concentration in human plasma, what would its killing profile look like compared to terapazamine? And it turns out that um, it would it, it theoretically should do substantially better, so we think that um, if we can get it into phase one clinical trial and look at the human plasma pharmacokinetics, which is always done in phase one clinical trials, we can actually give a good steer as to whether we're in a region where we're actually going to do better than terapazamine. Oh, I'll leave that. Okay, so so that's the SN30,000 story, which um, was really a success story for the computational modelling aspect. Um, I'll now go on to a couple of other investigations we've done, uh, which have perhaps not been quite so successful, and then I'll talk about some of the ways we're trying to overcome the limitations of the model that we're uh, that we've developed. So here's, a, um, here's this other compound, PL104, which has a, um, produces two, um, two compounds which are active and can diffuse out of the hypoxic regions. So basically, PL104 is, is given, it diffuses out into the, into the hypoxic regions. These uh, effector compounds are produced and they are meant to diffuse back into the surrounding well oxygenated regions and this is a way of not only trying to overcome hypoxia but to exploit hypoxia in tumours for the selective release of 
uh, cytotoxic anti-cancer drugs, which are, w would normally be too, uh, too cytotoxic to give as, uh, um, in, in a non-prodrug form. Instead, we can give, a, give them in an inactivated prodrug form and, uh, and get them to be released in the hypoxic region and then diffuse to and kill surrounding cells. And so we want, basically, well, there's, a, there's a number of these other compounds in, in development as well. We wanted to ask the question computationally, does, does this mechanism stack up and are we, are we, seeing, are we really seeing a bystander effect um, computationally? So we did, the same, we did the same set of tricks. We looked at diffusion studies in multi-layers, single cell suspension studies, put it into the model and predicted, predicted the tissue pharmacokinetics and here you can see the, just the diffusion of PR104A through two, two sets of multi-layers, diffusion of the activated metabolites out from, from anoxic multi-layers and we even bravely tried to measure the diffusion of the active metabolites which only have a half-life of about 20 minutes and managed to quantify them using sensitive LCMS techniques um, by putting the active metabolites into the donor compartment and measured the appearance in the receiver compartment. And that was, done, that was work done by two, two PhD students. However, this model um, was much more complex. We had to split. Um, we, we had to split the pharmacokinetics into an intracellular, extracellular compartment, and an intracellular compartment, rather than just averaging over the whole culture system, um, which which means that the whole thing did become extremely complex, especially since these compounds were also unstable. Um, However, we managed to develop a, develop a model for this, and here you can see the oxygen model and the model for one of the, one of the metabolites being produced in the most hypoxic regions and diffusing away from there, but not, not diffusing particularly far. And if we, uh, we, we tried to we split out the bystander effect, uh, so we, we ran the model for the complete set of parameters. We, we ran the model assuming that there was no bystander effect and we were able to uh, predict that approximately 40, appro approximately 50% of the activity of, of PR104A is, um, is due to the bystander effect being produced in severely hypoxic regions and diffusing out to surrounding regions. We predicted anti-tumor activity quite well with radiation, but predicted anti-tumor activity poorly without radiation. And one of the reasons for that, we think, is that real tumors have large areas of heterogeneity. So here's a large area in a real tumor where there's virtually no hypoxia and there's no way that these compounds are going to be able to diffuse from the hypoxic region and kill these cells here. So we can't really predict for a real tumour like this, but when we get rid of the uh, hypoxic cells by adding radiation, then what's left is we're predicting reasonably well for these areas where hypoxia, uh, hypoxia is reasonably homogeneously dispersed. So that points to one of the limitations of our models at present is they're fairly small regions. Um, they're too small, they're not really representative, and our solution to that is to do, is to do some vascular mapping to try and get some larger tumours. Um, another one is that we're not, we're, we're not uh, simulating the therapeutic ratio, so we're not saying anything about what these drugs are going to do to, um, to normal tissue, and we've, we've started the process of overcoming that by doing some simulations in some mapped microvascular networks of, um, of normal tissues. Um, but of particular interest to me is that our models lack time dependence, either, either time dependence of changing oxygen concentrations, changing drug concentrations, or of tumour growth, 
Our model is just a, a static snapshot of what's going on when you run the simulation. It doesn't. It, it, it's not a time-dependent model. Um, it doesn't have any cellular heterogeneity easily built into it. it doesn't have any molecular molecular pathways. Um, so, so what we're doing about this is recently. Um, We've teamed up with Gib Bogle in bioengineering to look at agent-based models of spheroids. And <coughs> tumor spheroids have been around for a long time. Um, they're actually uh, grown from a single cell uh, into a spherical uh, into a spherical tumor mass in the um, in the laboratory, they have properties very similar to the multicellular layers I showed, and a lot of work has been done to show that they have oxygen gradients, glucose, glucose distribution gradients. Um, the rapidly dividing cells are in the well oxygenated region, just like in normal tissues. They have distributions of ATP and um, and, and lactate, very similar to, to the types of distributions of nutrients that you see in, um, in real tumours because of this extravascular transport problem. And they're e fairly easily grown in the laboratory in these um, 96 well plates, either in ultra-low attachment plates or in a hanging drop system. Oops. Um, and this is a This is a video of them growing in the ultra-low attachment plates. And here we have a, a spheroid growing that hasn't been treated. Here's a spheroid growing which has been treated with a high concentration of ECM30,000. Um, and so they're, ve they're very easy to look at. You can grow a 96 well plate of them. You can treat them with a range of, range of drugs or a range of um, of radiation doses and then look at their growth delay by either uh, endpoints like this uh, where you're just looking at the spheroid size or by fluorescent endpoints where you put fluorescent markers in and look for the number of viable cells and um, you can see that this the growth of the spheroid has been greatly delayed by adding SN30,000. When the spheroids get too large you can't keep up with feeding them, and even if you're feeding them every second day, they use so much glucose from the medium that they actually become unstable, and you can see that this one has extruded its necrotic core. So this is um, the uh, one of the agent-based models that um, Gib has produced. It's an off-lattice um, model. Um, and you can just see the de the, the <coughs> development of um, of the spheroid mimic mimicking what you see in culture. So basically, um, what Gibb does, and I'm sure he will describe it better at some stage, but the uh, the gradients of oxygen and glucose concentration are solved using a um, uh, using the method of lines to solve the partial differential equations for the fields of oxygen, glucose and, and drug concentrations um, in the extracellular medium. In, uh, in, the, um, in the cells, a uh, series of differential equations describe the, the metabolism of, um, of oxygen, nutrients and, and drugs um, and you can so you can have a, um, a large number of nutrients. You can have a large number of um, of drugs. And one of the big advantages is that you can follow every single cell um, in the in this model. So, for example, here you've got the development of a necrotic core cells that are marked to die because they've been hypoxic for too long. Slowly growing cells in dark green because the oxygen and glucose concentration is too low. Um, and rapidly growing cells in light green uh, because they're, they're well fed from the medium. And these purple points represent cells that are undergoing mitosis. And just like in real spheroids, as the spheroid grows, um, a necrotic core develops where the cells have actually died and, and autolyzed. So this is very um, typical of what 
you see in histological sections of spheroids. This is a um, this this is just a simulation of the on lattice model that he's also produced, just to show that what we're going what we're attempting to do is to calibrate the model based on staining for hypoxia in spheroids or staining for proliferation. So here you can see green prol prol proliferation in experimental spheroids, hypoxia in experimental spheroids, and the model simulation based on that. This is the output of the model, which is quite cool because <coughs> um, the, here, um, for example, I've simulated giving um, nine fractions of three gray of radiation. Now this is something that would be extremely difficult to do um, in tissue culture, although not impossible. Um, but once we've calibrated the system, we will be able to run even more complicated simulations of drug uh, or radiation protocols um, than this, but just just as an illustration, you can see that each time you give a radiation dose, there's a temporary temporary halt in cell proliferation due to due to cells dying, and then the cells take off again. And th these are the cells that have been killed by radiation. This is the predicted um, decrease in the diameter. So this is this is the initial increase in diameter and it would keep on going up in a straight line. This is the growth delay that you would predict from from the model um, and it means that we can calibrate the, the model based on the output of, um, of the agent based model and experimental data. And just as an example We've done some radiation experiments and looked at radiation growth delay where a lead weed just put on a 96 well plate of spheroids and, um, and, um, and then the spheroids are followed over time from no, no treatment with radiation right up to a very high dose of radiation. And so you can see the growth delay quite clearly here. And I've had an initial attempt at simulating that growth delay. So using the survival curve for these cells under oxygen and noxic conditions and putting it into the model, um, here, here's the untreated spheroid and here's the spheroid treated with 3.9 gray of radiation. And it's, uh, here, at present it's over predicting the amount of killing and we've, got, we, we've made some improvements um, to to the model to see if we can simulate this more accurately. And a lot of uh, this work was done by a um, master student who's recently just finished. And Xinjiang is a PhD student. He's been looking at the oxygen dependence of the uh, spheroid growth because we need to calibrate this model for um, for the oxygen the oxygen dependence of, of cell growth. Um, and so he's looked at it at 20, under 20 percent, 5 percent, and 1 percent oxygen, and here you can see the predictions from the spheroid model. So we're doing reasonably well in predicting the um, oxygen dependence of spheroid growth. He's also been looking at um, spheroid growth as a function of glucose concentration, and you can see, uh, as I showed previously, glu uh, glucose uh, when glucose is, is depleted below about five <coughs> five millimolar the spheroid growth uh, slows right down. And we've, we've started the process of s simultaneously simulating the spheroid growth and the depletion of glucose from the, from the medium. And finally, um, an another possibility for these spheroids is to grow co-cultures of, uh, of cells here Green cells, which um, what are they? Green cells which activate um, the um, pro drugs, and red cells which have got the activating enzymes knocked down. So the green cells are metabolizing the pro drugs and and releasing PR104 very rapidly. The red cells have very little metabolism of PR104, 
um, and are very resistant are, are very resistant to the to PR104's um, action. Um, and if we grow these spheroids at a range of um, at a range of uh, different proportions of activating and target cells, you can see that as, as you increase the percentage of activating cells, um, th these are the activating cells, these are the target cells, as you here there's no activating cells in the co-culture and the spheroid is very resistant. Here there's 10% activating cells in the co-culture and 50% and activating cells in the co-culture showing that the uh, spheroid is the spheroid is becoming much more sensitive as the proportion of activating cells increases. So this is really the first biological demonstration of a convincing bystander effect of PR104A in cell cultures, which is something we didn't do in the previous PhD students um, um, studies. We we just did it by a modelling approach. Um, now we've actually confirmed that there is a bystander effect. And so we will be going on to model the bystander effect in he, here again is the um, off-lattice agent-based model with two different types of cell li line in it with mitosis in purple, um, gre green activators and red targets and we will be simulating the action of PR104 using the parameters from the previous PhD students' projects. So that's it from, from me. That's where we're going. just like to make some acknowledgements. Um, Mike Hay produced all of the SM30,000 compounds. Um, of course, Gib has been invaluable for developing these um, spheroid models, which is really going to help our interpretation of spheroid experiments, which have historically been quite easy to do, but quite difficult to interpret because you can't peek inside them. But mathematically, we can peek inside them. Um, and Sarah McManaway, who is the technician on our Marsden grant, who has done a lot of the work um, in developing the spheroid model in our lab, plus the two PhD students that I mentioned. Thank you. Um, for, for a lot of the drugs it tends to be a passive process and um, I showed that graph where the diffusion coefficient goes up dramatically with the lipophilicity of the drugs. Um, the multilayers tend not to be polarised like a monolayer where you've got active transport from one side to the other side because it's simulating the epithelial um, lining of, of the gut, for example. Um, Tumours don't tend to have that sort of polarity on a, on a three-dimensional scale, um, although under, certain, under certain, certain circumstances, certain types of tumours can form um, gap junctions and transfer drugs in that particular way and, and one or two compounds out there are trying to exploit the transport through gap junctions to to create a bystander effect between between cells that activate the drug and cells that can't activate the drug so it's not um, it, it's not there's not a simple answer, but in general, the default assumption is passive diffusion unless you've got good reason to think otherwise. So then, can you help me? I was having trouble understanding what was the mechanism. I thought it was a passive case, but what's the sort of real mechanism then of this change in the diffusion curve? And what's actually going on during the addition of oxygen in that sense? For, okay, so for terapazamine and 
Okay, so so there's no change in diffusion coefficient. In fact, we modelled it, assuming that the diffusion coefficient is the same under oxygen or anoxia. Okay. The 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 difference in 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 um, transport from uh, into the receiver compartment was modelled purely as a function of the metabolism under anoxia, and there's virtually no metabolism virtually no, no metabolism detectable for that type of compound when you do it under high oxygen conditions. So it's a fairly simple on-off system. It was a fairly simple system to, to get started on, basically. <laughs> yeah. But it would be more complicated if you couldn't turn it off and on like that. You do have to do, well, you have to do more simultaneous modelling, and that's, to a certain extent, what... One of the limitations with the PO104 study is we had to try and model diffusion of the parent and all the metabolites simultaneously. It became quite a curve fitting exercise. Yeah. So, if I understand correctly, when the drug is not metabolized, then it's not potent. Yes, that's oh, correct. Right, and then yeah. at the opposite end, if it is metabolized too rapidly, then you're not getting it to enough of the cells, it's getting used up. It's not, get, it's not, it, it, it it can get into the cells, and it can be and it can be shown to be very potent in monolayer culture or in stirred cell suspensions. But when you put it into a three D situation like a real tumor, it can't diffuse from the from the capillary to the most hypoxic cells because it's getting it's it's getting used up. Yeah. And so that was what you were showing with the uh, with the three D graph where you had a fall off in the in the potency of in, in the effect. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, yep. So, uh, in your uh, model for the uh, tumor growth, is a uh, R vascular model with no vessels inside? Yes, that's right. Uh, uh, do you have a plan for that in more like in vivo uh, situations out? There is some interaction between the vessels and the tumor, the cell growth. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to because that's really the end game. And um, there are a lot of models for both avascular and vascular tumour growth out there. Um, they, they've all got deficiencies that we've recognised and we're going to try and improve under this current Marsden grant. We're going to try and improve on the avascular tumour growth side of things. Um, there are some quite... Um, elegant models for the growth of tumours, agent-based growth of tumours and angiogenesis and blood, uh, blood vessel development. Uh, but there's two problems with it. Is one is the dimensionality of the problem and they, they just take so long to run that they tend to be impractical. Um, and and the, I guess the other problem that Irritates me a bit is that they've never they're they're only growth models. They've never really been used for investigating therapies, either of drugs or of radiation. Um, very much. Um, there's a few exceptions to that, but but on the whole, they they're not really used to to do what we are trying to do, um, and it's quite difficult to see how they would be. But um, yeah. I'd, I'd love to do it. I've just got to convince good. <laughs> Did you say that there was potentially variation in the leakiness of the vessels that are growing inside the tumour? Yes. How do you incorporate yep. that into the model, or do you...? No, so, so we don't. That's a, sim that's a simplifying assumption. Um, the the tumour vessels do tend to be quite leaky. Um, as a general rule, there's been quite a lot of work done to show that that leakiness produces a somewhat higher interstitial fluid pressure in tumours, and um, and you end up reaching a steady state where convection, the normal Starling forces, aren't operating anymore. So there's not usually not really the tissue convection that you would get in a normal tissue. Um, they they lack lymphatic drainage, so there's not really much transport by convection in most tumours, perhaps, except around the periphery. Um, so conveniently, we've been able to ignore that, although it's, it's totally includable in 
it in, in our models, and we've actually thought of how we could include it. Yeah. But the leakiness of the vessels is a fairly general phenomenon in tumours. Um, it is, it is, it will be variable between tumour types, and it will be variable between place to place in tumours. But it, it's been shown that it's it's a pretty um, universal phenomenon as they as the deregulated angiogenesis increases. So with the, the final um, model, the like you showed, where you had to activate a cells, uh, find target cells, is that? Um, well, what's the purpose of that model? Is it to show that you have the bystander effect with these uh, drug candidates? Or yes, well, um, yeah. So one, one thing that we've never really been able to do is uh, um, we've done quite a lot of work. We, we've actually produced multi-layer co-cultures like this um, probably over the last 10 years and used them for screening. Um, in those co-cultures, they, they tended to be a... Um, a, met a metabolizing enzyme which works under well oxygenated conditions. So you've got high and low metabolism under well oxygenated conditions, and we've shown bystander effects in that system. But what? But sometimes the chemical reaction that goes on can be quite different under hypoxia compared to under well oxygenated conditions, and we've never really had the ability to um, to to either experimentally look at. Um, the co-cultures of hypoxia cytotoxin activating drugs or to model it. So the first thing we want to do is use this model as a way of, um, as a way of seeing whether our, how close our PR104 para parameters predict the, um, the increased killing in co-cultures. Um, th that's definitely the the long term goal. It's not always that the activating cells will be closer to the hypoxic regions. They could be randomly distributed. They, um, in fact, the activating enzymes potentially could even be downregulated in the hypoxic region as the cells become sick and start to die. So um, it's a matter of mapping that, and we have started some. Um, some work on mapping some of these uh, hypoxia activating enzymes as a function of function of distance in um, in tumours. So that could that, that could definitely easily be put into Gibbs model. It would be much more difficult to put it into the Green's function model, which is basically a pretty much completely a continuum model, even though it even though it um, distinguishes between intracellular and extracellular compartments. It doesn't really distinguish between cells and non-cells. Non it doesn't have individual cells in it where you can have a particular level of an enzyme and next, next or a lower level or something like that. So it would be a much more difficult job. Yeah, that's why we want to try and calibrate a lot of this using the simpler spheroid model. Thank Kevin for a very interesting seminar. Thank you.